Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 2021 Ansel Hoffman Restoration Project Virtual Open House. I'm Erica Bishop, the Water Forms Program Manager in charge of this year's implementation. Our Executive Director, Jessica Law, couldn't be here with us tonight, but on her behalf, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for taking time out of a beautiful summer evening to um, hear more about this year's Habitat Project, plans for Ansel Hoffman Park. Next slide. Uh, before we get into details, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with you to help everything run smoothly. The webinar is being recorded so uh, folks can watch it later. Feel free to submit any of your questions as we go using the Q&A button. We'll answer questions after the presentation as time allows. If you need technical help, text Kathy and her number is here on the screen. Next slide. A uh, quick overview of what we'll share tonight. Uh, you'll hear several voices from our team uh, talking about the history and life cycle of salmon in this Lower American River, an overview of past projects, details about this year's project at Ansel Hoffman, information regarding how we're working with the Nature Center to make this as educational as possible, and what to expect as a neighbor or visitor to the park this summer. So a little bit about our organization. Over 20 years ago, local leaders formed the City County Office of Metropolitan Water Planning, which we know as the Water Forum. The Water Forum brings together water providers, environmentalists, business groups, and local governments to serve our co-equal objectives, which strive to balance the water needs of people and the environment on the Lower American River. And although we love the river, we can't do this all ourselves. So this project is made possible through a partnership between several local, state, and federal agencies. Um, these include the Water Forum, which coordinates restoration in cooperation with Bureau of Reclamation and provides City of Sacramento Department of Utilities personnel to construct the projects. Bureau of Reclamation, which funds our habitat projects and which is mandated by the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, since they are the operators of Folsom and Nimbus dams. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service implements the CBPIA activities with reclamation. The California Dep Department of Fish and Wildlife provides equipment operators, habitat management help, and salmon monitoring throughout the year. Uh, Sacramento County Regional Parks, as manager of the American River Parkway, actually hosts all of our restoration projects in the end. Park staff provide input and guidance during the design and implementation so we can coordinate the work with the many uses of the parkway. Uh, SAFCA provides vital permitting support so that we um, follow all of the requirements of the Corps of Engineers and Central Valley Flood Protection Board and ensure that our projects don't have any effects to flood risk in the area. And this year we have a new partner, the FEON Nature Center. A special shout out to Ken Anderson, their director. He's been instrumental in helping us get the word out, providing a venue for our in-person open houses, and we're really excited to work with his staff and all of his fantastic volunteers to share this work with visitors to the Nature Center this year. And now I'll turn it over to Kat Perkins, one of our Water Forum staff, for uh, more information about salmon in the river. Thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give you some kind of salmon biology basics um, and some info on our past projects. Um, so understanding a bit about uh, salmon and steelhead is, is important for understanding um, the why and how of, of these projects. Um, so the Lower American River is home to uh, native anadromous fish. Anadromous means that fish are born in fresh water, they migrate to the ocean and they, and they return to fresh water um, to complete their life cycles. Um, and in the Lower American River, we have um, both fall run Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. Um, steelhead trout are the anadromous version of rainbow trout. Um, and uh, fall run Chinook are, are um, a run of um, Chinook salmon, also called king salmon. Um, they're, they're the most abundant of the runs of salmon in the Central Valley, but um, their populations have severely declined. Um, steelhead trout are listed threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and these, these fish, they're, they use the Lower American River um, for certain parts of their life cycle. Um, they use it to spawn and to rear. Um, and uh, to, to do that, they need certain uh, habitat requirements. Um, 
They need um, the right water temperatures. They need the right water flows. Um, those are really big factors, but they also need um, appropriately sized gravel to be able to spawn. Um, and they need food and cover when they're, when they're babies. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, these fish are, are native to the Central Valley. Um, they've been here for millions of years. Um, but since humans showed up, since um, Western civilization showed up, we've changed these rivers really significantly. Um, and one of the biggest ways that we've done that is by building dams. Um, so that, uh, that graphic that you see on the right-hand uh, right side of the screen, um, those stream segments that are shown in black are um, blocked by dams. So it's a really significant portion of the habitat that anadromous fish used to use. Um, and um, yeah, these dams have really significant impacts on, on these species. Um, it's, they're these giant walls that fish can't um, pass above. And these dams also um, block the natural flow of sediment, flow of, of rocks um, from mountains to, to valleys. Um, so they both uh, reduced the amount of habitat these fish have available to them, and they've degraded the habitat that, that they do have available to them. Um, so understanding kind of the unnatural history of the Central Valley is, is really important for understanding um, why these projects are needed. Um, next slide, I'm gonna zoom in on the, on the Lower American River. Um, so the sections that you see in red here are blocked by Nimbus and Folsom dams. Um, and that, that little uh, blue stretch of water is the Lower American River. Um, and that's what anadromous fish have available to them. Um, so these fish are, are spawning and rearing in our beautiful urban Sacramento. Um, we're, we're very lucky to live in a place with beautiful runs of, of anadromous fish. Um, but um, that human civilization um, often kind of conflicts with um, what these species uh, need. Um, the Lower American River is a, is a pretty constrained waterway. It's, um, it's got Nimbus Dam, um, it's got Folsom Dam, uh, which are providing a lot of benefits to us people who enjoy living here in Sacramento, um, like flood control and water storage um, and electricity, but they also cause, cause a lot of problems for, for fish. So these projects are, are aimed at mitigating some of those issues. Next slide. So um, a really important piece of legislation for these projects is the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, CVPIA, as it's often called. Um, this uh, this uh, law, which was passed by Cong Congress in 1992, uh, provides um, the impetus for these projects and the funding mechanism. So this uh, law established a rest restoration fund, um, which is financed by water and power users, um, to be able to do habitat restoration and enhancement. Um, and this, this project is part of the implementation um, of, of this act. Um, and uh, it's implemented by the US Bureau of Reclamation, which is the agency that's responsible for operating dams and, um, and local partners. And here in Sacramento, uh, that's the Water Forum. Next slide. Yeah, so um, we've been doing this since 2008. Um, it's our 10th habitat restoration project. Um, some, some stats, we've built uh, 30 plus acres of spawning beds, uh, 1.2 miles of side channels, and we place 92,000 cubic yards of spawning gravel in the river. Um, uh, we've invested over $7 million, which seems like a lot of money, but uh, we get a lot of uh, bang for our buck in terms of the benefit that these dams provide and the, and the benefit um, that these projects provide for uh, salmon and steelhead. Um, next slide, I'm gonna uh, get into uh, our past projects. Um, this is a picture of Upper Sailor Bar, which is our last project, which we built not last year, but the year before. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, these projects are really important. They create crucial habitat that native salmon and steelhead um, need to improve their survival. Um, and we generally build these projects um, in 
two parts. Uh, we create spawning beds by laying clean rock into uh, the main channel of the river. And we often also create rearing habitat by carving new side channels or like you'll hear about at Ansel Hoffman this year, alcoves, um, that kind of off-channel habitat that baby fish need. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, so these are some before and afters of um, Upper Sailor Bar. Um, I, these are kind of like, um, I don't know, the salmon equivalent of like interior design before and afters. Um, if, you're, if you're a salmon or a steelhead, you're like, wow, I really want to live in this after. Um, so a little interpretation here, those light patches that you see in the main channel of the river are the spawning beds. Um, they're lighter because they're shallower spots of freshly cleaned and placed uh, gravel that's the right size for fish to be able to build their reds. Um, and then on the side there you see the, the side channel which is a new um, waterway that's carved out on the side of the river. Um, and if you're a baby steelhead that looks like a great place for you to um, hide and catch some, catch some prey. Um, yeah, next slide. So another picture of our last project, Upper Sailor Bar, we put this infographic together um, to show um, an example of um, the monitoring that we do um, and, and the success that we've, that we've seen uh, with this project. Um, so a photo in the upper left-hand corner is um, the year before we implemented the restoration project. Uh, the larger photo is the year right after we implemented the project. So um, when salmon build, when they build reds, when they spawn, um, the female uh, excavates uh, the gravel with her tail fin. And in doing that, she actually creates these patches of cleaned excavated gravel that you can see from a plane. So one of the ways that we monitor fish use of our sites is by taking aerial photographs and actually counting all of those reds. Um, so we saw a huge increase uh, post-project in spawning use of the site, um, didn't count any reds the year before and the year after our project, um, over 1600 reds. Um, yeah, so uh, this is an example, like I said, of how we monitor and how we see if um, the fish are using the habitat that we build and we're um, constantly kind of collecting data and improving our projects um, based on the data that we, that we collect. Um, yeah, and these projects are really, they're really awesome. They're really rewarding because, you know, as we hope that we, we get to build these projects um, at the end of summer and then fall around Chinook um, get to use them for spawning uh, immediately after. Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Erica um, to talk about our project this year. Well, thanks Kat for that overview of our past projects, recent past projects. Um, I'll cover just a few nuts and bolts before we get into the actual project design for Ansel Hoffman. You might wonder why this site? Uh, this site was chosen because Ansel is a place where fish have historically spawned. However, during our fisheries monitoring, aerial photos show a decline in the number of reds. And um, this coincides with a decline in habitat quality as the spawning areas change over time due to the natural river flows and use by the fish themselves. Um, as Kat mentioned, they, um, they move the gravel around during spawning, so they actually do, um, they cause the gravel to move themselves. Also, this site is lower than the river than many of the other areas where we've conducted recent projects. So this means that the rearing component is even more important since uh, the baby fish naturally move down the river with the current. So any uh, fish that hatch farther upriver could use this site on their way down. Um, on our project schedule, as currently scheduled, um, the project will begin in late August and finish in October before the main fall run to next spawning season. Once construction is underway, uh, the city crews might be on site Monday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, that sounds pretty early, but note that only quiet activities like safety meetings and equipment maintenance occur from 6 to 7 a.m. Um, earth moving and uh, gravel sorting, other activities that are noisier won't start until 7. And in-river work is Monday through Friday, so not on the weekends. Uh, but not on Labor Day, so no work on Labor Day, even though that is a weekday. 
Um, next slide. Um, it's important to, to know that even though this project is intended to improve spawning and rearing habitat, so it's, it's a good project, um, we still have to go through all of the same permitting, approval, consultation, and reviews that any other project, such as levy or bridge work, would need to go through prior to construction. Um, I don't need to read this entire list to you, but you can see that the environmental review for this project is very comprehensive, and all of these documents are available online and are linked um, on the project webpage. Next slide. Um, on that note, we receive many questions each year regarding the timing of this work from folks who are worried when they see equipment working in the river. Um, and know that during planning, we do work closely with our fisheries agencies on in our environmental review. They help us look at the timing of the various life stages of fish in the river. And you see a few of those here shown with the shading. Since steelhead are the species with the most protection, in that they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, we're required to adhere to strict work windows mandated by uh, National Marine Fishery Service, known as NIMFS, to reduce disturbance during construction to a time when flows are low and we have the least chance of affecting um, our most, um, the fish with the most protection at the site. Um, this work window is highlighted in green and covers the late summer and early fall months. And you'll see that our project construction time frame, time frame is just the small little blue block within that larger work window. Next slide. So uh, here you see an overview of our project site. You can see on this map that the construction zone will start just upriver from the nature center and extend downstream to about even with the golf course. The trails uh, in the upland areas will meet, remain open and our construction equipment will be staged in this orange area at the south end of the site that you see on the map. So it won't affect any parking for the public, uh, like for the golf course. Um, as Kat mentioned, we're enhancing spawning and rearing habitat. Basically, the way we'll do this is by excavating the rearing alcove area that you see here in various shades of blue. Uh, we'll sort that material on site. You see our gravel sorting area marked off. And we place rocks that are the right size for spawning into the river on the spawning uh, habitat enhancement spot that you also see on the map. Uh, to pro protect water quality during construction, we wash the gravel that's excavated out of the rearing alcove before it's placed in the river. And if all goes as planned, fish will spawn in this gravel this year and in years to come, hopefully. And once the fish have hatched, they need places like the rearing alcove to survive. After excavation and grading are finished, the alcove will create places for those young fish to hide from predators and grow. Um, to provide nooks within the alcove for the young fish, we will be placing some large woody tree structures. Uh, this acts in a way similar to how you see um, wood naturally occurring in the river. You see fish gathering around and under those logs. And also around the rearing alcove, we'll be able to plant willow cuttings. And the willows provide shade and cover. They help improve the water temperature and increase survival. And they also um, host aquatic insects, which fall off the branches and are eaten by our rearing fish in the alcove area. Next slide. Back one, there we go. Uh, forward one to the um, drawing. There we go. Uh, here you see a schematic of our planned spawning area. So don't get too lost in the details. Just know that what may look like a bunch of rocks in the river is actually carefully designed to salmon specifications. As Kat described, in the egg laying process, females create reds in loose gravel. They deposit their eggs and cover them with more gravel. For this to be effective as a nursery for the fish, the reds must have flowing water over the gravel and through the nooks and crannies within the gravel itself. This helps keep oxygenated water coming to the fish eggs and to carry waste away from the reds during incubation. The salmon are very particular about the size of rock they like for spawning. It's about the size of your fist. And our crews place the spawning gravel into the river according to these detailed project plans. Um, this helps to create the right slope and depth and give the fish eggs the best chance of survival. Next slide. Um, here you see a couple of examples of uh, spawning habitat construction at a few of our past sites. You'll see that after our material is excavated and sorted, it's put in the river with a loader or dump truck. After they create all of these small gravel piles that you see, 
they push the gravel around with a bulldozer to get it to that appropriate slope and depth um, according to the specs like you saw on the previous screen. And you'll see a berm or an outline around this work area. And this is created with the first several loads of gravel. This helps block off the work area from the main river flow as much as possible. Um, this helps to provide an area for adult or juvenile fish to pass during construction. It also allows um, for recreational boaters to pass during construction safely, and it helps to protect water quality from being disturbed too much during construction because it keeps a lot of the turbidity and the dirty water within that work area. And next slide. Uh, here you see a schematic of the planned rearing alcove. As Kat mentioned, once hatched out of the reds, young salmon uh, would move to the river shallower, slower moving areas, similar to this or side channels that we've conducted, constructed at past sites. As our crews carve the rearing alcove, they will grade this area so you'll, it will have water in it and provide protection at various depths. It does have a very low flow channel that you see, it looks like a large V, that is to help prevent fish stranding during our lowest flows. And you'll see on this drawing what look like X's. Um, this is a representation of some of our woody habitat, which is comprised of tree trunks and root wads. We place that along the bottom and along the edges of the alcove and the deeper areas to provide that cover for the baby fish. And our willows and other small bushes would be planted around the edges of this area so that they hang over. Next slide. And here are a couple of examples of some past rearing habitat construction. This is an upper sailor bar where we actually um, constructed a side channel through the existing gravel bar that really, uh, the juvenile steelhead really enjoyed that site. Um, this year we're building an alcove instead. This will serve a similar purpose for juvenile fish except that it isn't connected to the main river at both ends like a side channel would be. Um, during the design, we found that putting a side channel at Ansel Hoffman wasn't going to be the best for the fish. Actually, the flows and the gradient were going to be a little too steep. So the alcove should work better at this site. Um, we're excited that we're able to plant our um, willows and put our woody material in the alcove. We didn't have a chance to do that at uh, some of the past side channel sites. And uh, know that in order to add these woody features or construct any of the spawning and rearing habitat, um, we do provide extensive modeling information to the core and the Central Valley Flood Protection Board to show that we aren't impacting flood space in the river or causing any impediments to flows within the floodway while we enhance this habitat. Next slide. Um, go ahead and play. There we go. Here we have some drone footage of some past construction taken by our very own uh, team member, John Hannon. Um, a fun fact, these are river-friendly equipment you see driving around here. No, they don't actually go that fast. This is a time lapse. Um, these river-friendly equipment are inspected and pressure washed daily, and they use vegetable oil and marine-grade grease, which is cleaner than what is required for land-based equipment. So this is much better for water quality protection uh, when we're having these equipment in the river. And although the equipment is river friendly, the in-river portion of the work is only a few days out of the several weeks of construction. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on to Kent with FEI Nature Center. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kent Anderson. I'm the executive director of the FEI Nature Center. And I'd like to start by saying um, the Nature Center is very excited and appreciative of this partnership opportunity in support of this project. Uh, the Nature Center is gonna be working with the Water Forum and the team on four primary areas uh, related to our work. So the first component of that will be that the Nature Center will be providing public tours during the construction um, of the project. This will allow the public to get a, a bird's eye view of what the project is looking like and to provide information to those who may not be aware that the project is occurring. Um, our plan is to provide scheduled tours on a regular basis throughout the duration of the construction of the project to provide drop-in opportunities uh, on particular days that will be scheduled so that visitors to the nature center and the nature study area will have an opportunity to go take a look even if they didn't attend one of the scheduled tours. Um, and to also provide some event and activity days primarily focused on uh, families and children uh, with opportunities to uh, engage in conservation related and environmentally friendly activities and then to do tours with us as well. 
We're really appreciative of this next opportunity, which uh, will be some improvements to some of the trails that are adjacent to the river area, um, primarily around ADA access. Um, it is our goal to improve those trails to make it easier for visitors and uh, folks to make their way to the river, not only to experience the river itself, but also to take a look at the project um, during the process and once it has been completed. Uh, the Water Forum is also working with us to improve and upgrade our interpretive signage throughout the nature study area, um, which we're very excited about as well. The signage that is throughout the nature study area is really important. Um, we see between 100 and 200,000 people visiting uh, the FEI Nature Center every year. And many of those people don't actually come inside the nature center itself. They visit by visiting the river or uh, walking through our trails and those interpretive signs will uh, give us the opportunity to interact with people um, without having to physically be there to do so. And you can see a picture of one of the signs that we'll be working on here in the slide. And the last uh, way that we are partnering with the Water Forum uh, is that they are helping us to in, uh, create and install a new exhibit uh, in the museum that will be happening this fall. Um, again, we're particularly excited about this feature as well. Um, this will be an opportunity to uh, directly impact the folks who are coming to the Nature Center and uh, traveling through the museum. And the exhibit will focus on um, uh, riparian environments, streams, and watersheds with a key focus on the salmon and the steelhead uh, in our river, their biology, and uh, uh, other elements that are related to the project. So once again, the Nature Center is very excited to be participating in this project. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Christine. Hi, I'm Christine and I'm an outreach coordinator for the Water Forum. Welcome everyone tonight. Um, before I get started, just a reminder that if you do have questions, we're happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Just uh, add them to the Q&A, which is in the, the bottom of your screen in the middle and those go directly to the project team. So uh, in addition to being an outreach coordinator, I am also a neighbor of Ansel Hoffman. And as such, I get to talk about what to expect as a neighbor and as a park user during construction. So um, first of all, the main impact we think is going to be the noise. Um, again, crews will be on site between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, with noise starting at seven. And the most of the noise will come from the machinery you see here in this picture, which is the rock sorter, which sorts the gravel to just the right size that salmon like the size of your fist. Um, uh, and those, the rock sorter is expected to be working uh, mostly during the week, um, Monday through Friday. The other uh, thing to expect might be some traffic. There's about a dozen employees that will be going to and from the project site at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. Also, you saw some of the large construction equipment and that will be going to the site at the beginning of the project and the end of the project. Also, uh, access to the river so during construction, access to the, from the shore to the river in the project area is going to be blocked. But during non-work hours, the construction equipment will be fenced off. There is going to be um, security on site and the public will be able to um, be near the river. Rafters will be able to go through the, the river and um, access the shore. And the other thing that we're thinking about is uh, taking care of the rafters. So as has been mentioned, construction, um, in-river construction will play, take place on weekdays, Monday through Friday, but not on Labor Day. And uh, you can, uh, for rafters, you can consider the area like uh, traffic, a traffic construction zone where you have folks with walkie talkies. And we'll have one of the project team members at the top of the construction area, letting rafters know that there's construction ahead and uh, radioing to the construction team that rafters are coming. 
Also, we have been working hard to reach out to the rafting companies to provide information, post notes, notices. And uh, as we get closer to construction, we'll put signage out at popular raft entrance points on the river, just letting them know that there's construction in the Ansel Hoffman area and to be alert. Uh, let's see, parking. Parking is not expected to be impacted um, because the crews and the equipment will be off-site, not on the paved areas. And um, one final thing is, you know, if you have questions during construction, please feel free to contact the project team. Um, if you uh, are a neighbor like I am, you will have received a mailer and the project team number and website and sorry, email is listed there. That information is also listed online at waterforum.org slash AH. It's also going to be on our construction signage around the park. And believe it or not, that uh, contact at waterforum.org does go to someone. That phone number does go to someone. And that person is Kat, who you've met tonight. So uh, again, please. Ask your questions through the Q&A and uh, we're getting near the end. Actually, I think we're just about there. I'm gonna turn this back over to Erica and uh, let's see if we have some questions. All right, well, thank you to our presenters and all of our participants. We have a good number of folks who've joined us tonight. Uh, if you would like more information about the project, we do have a project specific website that has um, dates and times for our in-person open houses, information about the project. As I mentioned, all the environmental documentation for the project is linked there for those who are curious. And that will also take you to um, information about past projects and uh, successes we've had there. Um, we hope that you're able to join us at one of our in-person open houses coming up over the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll be opening up for questions now. If you type your questions into the Q&A, Kat is going to help field them to the right panelists, and we look forward to um, continued discussion. Thank you all again. Thanks, Erica, and thanks everyone for chatting. Some great questions. Um, so, panelists, um, if you want to turn on your turn on turn on your camera, um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask these questions that came in. Um, so there's a couple questions about um, Nimbus fish, fish hatchery, um, which I'm gonna ask uh, Ian to answer or, or John who's also on. Um, Ian, could you talk about the, the role and the purpose of the hatchery um, and maybe why wild spawning also matters? Yeah, I can touch on that. Sure, Kat, thank you. Um, my name is Ian Smith, everybody. I'm a fish biologist with the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, one of the partners on this project. Um, so the Nimbus fish hatchery, um, it was constructed following the Nimbus Dam, and it was to mitigate the loss of fish not blocked upstream from Nimbus because that already had the Folsom Dam, but to mitigate for fish loss below the dam, so the Lower American River. Um, and it's been in operation, I think, since 1956 um, is when it was constructed, if I remember correctly. And they produce Chinook, Fall Run Chinook, and they produce steelhead. And you're probably wondering, if we have production in the hatchery, why do we need the wild production? Um, legally, the CVPIA act that Kat had, or somebody had mentioned earlier um, has a doubling goal in it. So we need to double the goal, the double the number of fish that are naturally produced in our rivers, in the CVPIA rivers. And natural production means not hatchery production. Um, hatcheries have a whole slew of issues that come with them. They are good fixes for rivers that have been devastated with fish or devastated fish populations and you need to enhance fish populations in those rivers because there's no other way to do it. Um, but there's, you take out a lot of the natural selection with a fish hatchery. So 
in the wild, the fish go, they partner up, they spawn in the gravel, they compete with other fish and natural selection occurs. In the hatchery, we don't have this. Um, the fish that are produced in hatcheries show signs of inbreeding. They show signs of lack of fecundity. So their egg, the amount of eggs in them is drastically lower than wild produced fish, just which is a, a testament to their overall health that they're not as healthy as natural born wild raised fish. Um, I think one of the questions was why do we need or what is the importance of naturally spawning fish in terms of regards to hatchery fish. Um, naturally spawning fish are a boom to the ecosystem of a river. Essentially what they are are big vitamin packets um, that grew out in the ocean and come back up into our rivers, spawn, lay their eggs, and then die. And they do more than 99% of their growth in the ocean. And the ocean waters are rich in nitrogen that can only be found in marine waters, marine derived nutrients. So when the fish come back to the river and spawn and die, they leave that, which helps bolster the riparian area, plants, um, use it for growth at nitrogen, animals, it creates a lot of production, um, the fish, uh, things that eat the fish, so such as birds, um, small critters, they all get that and they, they benefit from that. So salmon, natural spawning salmon are a boom to river's health. Uh, healthy populations of salmon in a river usually mean that river is pretty healthy. And ultimately, I think the goal of these projects is to make this river healthier for salmon. Um, we blocked a lot of their upstream passage with the dams and they're limited now to just the downstream portion below Nimbus. Um, and there's limiting factors in that, in that area, such as spawning gravel and rearing habitat. And those are the two things that this project is going to help bolster to make those wild runs stronger. Bit long winded. Um, I hope I covered yeah. stuff, everything. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, Ian. I'm sorry I forgot to introduce you. It's it's great to have you. And um, yeah, thanks for for telling that story. I think it's it's a beautiful one. Um, how how uh, how naturally spawning fish uh, fit into fit into this ecosystem. Um, so some other great questions. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Erica this one. Um, do we expect the project to require a decrease in water discharge um, in excess of what is normally discharged during this time of year from Nimbus Dam? So it, it sounds, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the person who asked that question, but it sounds like you're asking, are we requiring, do we have to reduce our flows in order to construct this project? is what I'm hearing. And that is, no, we don't. Um, we intentionally construct these projects during what are normally the lowest flows of the year um, so that we can, um, one, for safety, and two, because the, that is the time during, we have, during which we have the fewest life stages of all of our various species in the river. Um, so we try to get the work done when flows are low, uh, nat well, not naturally, but <laughs> they're low as far as Folsom and Nimbus dams are operated at this point in time. Um, and then we're out of the river in time for flows to come up in the fall, which they do um, based on precipitation and also to help our um, steelhead out migrate and for our um, fall run spawning fish to help get up and spawn into the farther up into the river. So we don't have any manipulations of Folsom or Nimbus flows and directly tied to this project. Um, and actually, on, on that same point, we are limited. If, if for whatever reason we had a massive water year, um, we are not allowed to work in the river if flows are over 5,000 CFS. So, um, if that hopefully that answers your question, um, please type something else in the QA if you need more information. Yeah, follow up. But, um, thanks, Erica. Another question for you um, Could you talk about water quality a bit? What's the question is, what is the expected and allowable risk with water quality downriver of the projects um, in regards to water clarity and silt that could have a negative effect um, on residential uh, rainbow and steelhead populations? So 
So <clears throat> I'll answer on the water quality piece and then I'll let Ian chime in on specific effects to fish um, as far as gills and, and that sort of thing. Um, as far as strict water quality requirements, we have to operate the construction under the requirements of the Clean Water Act Section 401. We, under our permit, we are allowed to, um, we, we can cause some turbidity in the water, but it's not a lot. Um, the turbidity measurements in the water are based on how turbid your water is without a project. So the American River is nice and clear, which means that the amount that we're allowed to make it not clear is very low. Um, we, um, the details of that are within our permit um, that is available on our website, and I'm happy to give more information on that. But the background turbidity affects how much more turbidity you can add to the water. If we go over that threshold, we have to stop work and allow the water to clear. And um, as I mentioned, our work, our actual in-river work that causes a slight rise in turbidity for a portion of the day, it does clear overnight. Um, on those days that we are working in the river, but it's usually only about a week's worth of work where we're actually in the river causing turbidity. The rest of the time is um, site setup and teardown. Um, the excavation of the rearing alcove will um, most likely be in the dry this year because of our expected water levels, and um, we do everything that we can to protect water quality. I'll let Ian um, chime in on any specific effects to the resident fish. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, <laughs> just to note on that, on previous projects, uh, the threshold has been 12 NTU, which is a measurement of turbidity. Uh, it's rather a low measurement of turbidity. So we sample throughout the construction every day, um, hourly, or when things arise that need sampling, um, we test that turbidity. And if that turbidity does go over 12 NTUs, we shut down operations until the water clears up. So just to make that no, um, these, the turbidity caused by these projects and how we manage it and not release it all at once, we do a very good job at it. And there's really no detriment to the fish from these turbidity clouds that get washed down. Turbidity naturally occurs in watersheds after a big rain event, if we ever have another big rain event. Um, it it mud muddies up the river, right? and takes all that allochthonous input and pushes it downstream, making it turbid. Um, so fish are used to it. Some, actually some juveniles use turbidity to help migrate downstream. It's protection from predators within those turbidity clouds. Um, but it, in the American River on these projects, it settles out real quick and it's not an issue to our fish. Thanks, Ian and Erica. Um, so this is a fun question. Um, Alan says, so awesome. Do you need help planting willows? Um, I can try to answer that. I, I feel like we probably can't take volunteers planting willows this, this time around. Um, others correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, um, but I can probably use your help on another project. We've got other habitat projects that we do. I can probably use you as a, as a volunteer, maybe out at Cordova Creek. So uh, shoot me an email um, at uh, contact at waterforum.org if you're if you're really interested in uh, in doing some some planting work. Um, so uh, so another question: um, What is the project plan to mitigate an environmental emergency or hazmat on site during construction? Um, Eric, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, at, in, in compliance with all of our permit requirements, we do have to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan on site. Um, we don't usually have storm events during construction due to the time of year, but we do have to have site controls in place to ensure that we don't have any sort of um, erosion or sedimentation. Um, as far as environmental emergency or hazmat, the um, equipment is maintained in the construction parking area. So that is not down near the river. It's not in the floodway at all, actually. Um, we also have the refueling on site does not, there, there is no fuel tank on site. A truck comes and fuels the, the equipment and leaves each day. So we don't have to worry about fuel management of a tank, but um, that is all conducted with the, um, the appropriate site controls as far as where the fueling is and having the, um, the absorbent 
materials and everything that we need to have uh, mobile refueling. And um, I think that probably is the most pertinent environmental hazard would be a, a, a fuel or an oil spill into the river. Thanks, Erica. Um, so a participant said that they, um, they walk at Sailor Bar a lot and they noticed that many people take their dogs down to the river um, and let them swim. Um, and they've noticed that some of those spots are where they see fish spawning. Um, maybe Ian, is that something that you'd, you'd worry about being damaging to the fish? Uh, I could touch on it real quick. Um, so yeah, the Sailor Bar project, it was an immediate success and we saw a lot of fish return to it. And I'm sure you're seeing the benefits of that. Um, the spawning fish right there where the, the side channel comes out, they like to spawn there as well. And actually up the side channel, we, Kat and I counted a bunch of reds up there. Um, so yeah, dog, I mean, I just real quick, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and how many times a dog has brought home a salmon to me, it's, it's countless. <laughs> So yeah, if the dog sees the fish in the river, they will, they'll go after it, um, especially in those shallower waters. But I, I don't think it's a huge concern. Um, but do, do, you know, base it on timing, what time are the fish spawning? So the fish will be spawning up there from, oh, fall run are up there, maybe October spawning until February. Um, and then the steelhead are December through May. So if you see dogs and fish at the same time, maybe, yeah, let them know that the dogs could be disturbing the reds. Thanks, Ian. Um, so a participant was wondering um, whether waterform weighs in on development proposals that encroach upon the floodplain, specifically wondering about the Cassis property. Um, Cassis development we've talked about in some water forum meetings. So I encourage you to like go on our website. We, we post when we have public meetings, um, if you're interested in our in our work more, more broadly. Erica, anything you wanna add on that? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I was <laughs> um, I No, I don't have any more to add on that. I don't believe that water forum has taken a position on that project, um, but I do know that water forum um, is in active communication with many entities that have taken a position on the project. And I encourage you to get, you know, get in contact with us and we could talk more. But yeah. I'm also very new to the water forum. So um, there could be additional information regarding whether or not we have taken a position or have had discussions regarding that project that may have been conducted by Jessica that I'm just not aware of. Yeah, thanks Erica. Yeah, get, get in touch, we can talk more. Um, uh, so um, someone's wondering about the, the, the red count on the American River um, to date. And I think they're asking about um, red count at projects, at restoration projects, um, and kind of what we expect. Um, I, I do some of the work counting reds. I'm, I'm not sure I have that kind of, um, those numbers memorized, maybe John does. Um, we also have some great summary graphics, some cool charts on the Water Forum website under fish conditions. Um, it's interesting stuff. Um, John, if you're on and you want to add, add anything. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't, I couldn't tell you how many, how many reds we've counted. It's a lot. I count a lot of, a lot of, a lot of dots in the river um, when I do the red counts. Um, and we're, we're hoping that, um, that spawning will, will increase at the site um, after the project. Um, yeah, this is John. Um, I think it doesn't look like my video works, but I think the red, the question might be aimed kind of at the amount of habitat increase. So, what this is about a three, three acres of spawning habitat, which is maybe, uh, say, approximately 5% increase in, in available spawning habitat for the river, roughly, I'd say. Thank you so much, John. Um, okay, question about um, who else is part of the project team? Who actually does the work alongside the water form, construction, design, et cetera? Um, Erica, you want to talk about that? Who's on sure. construction design, our whole team? Yeah, so um, the water form coordinates the work in partnership with Reclamation. The Bureau of Reclamation is heavily involved in design 
and funding under the CBPIA. Our, could we have a consultant team who help us with project designs and some of the permitting. Our um, project team, our hydraulic modeling and sediment transport modeling and design have been conducted by CBEC Eco Engineers and NHC, so shout out to them. Um, and our construction actually is conducted by City Department of Utilities employees that we had a graph a picture of them in one of the first slides. Um, they actually love this project. Uh, it's, a, it's really fun for them to get to help. It's really different than a lot of the work that they get to do. You know, they're doing a lot of, you know, clearing of culverts and things like that. So um, the city crews really enjoy working on these projects since it's a, it's a good thing. I'm trying to think uh, who else. We do have some consultants who help us with our environmental documentation. That is GEI consultants. And I'm trying to think, uh, we have Kramer Fish Sciences who conduct monitoring on the river. And um, we have our in-communications and MMS strategies folks who help us with getting the word out, organizing events like this webinar and the open houses. Um, I think those are our, our actual consultant team. And then we work with partners throughout the region. Um, various water agencies are supportive of the projects um, and you know, are involved in the water forum effort to help us decide which project we're going to do, which site we're going to choose for each year. That is all um, vetted through our various water forum groups, fish group and habitat group. So there are a lot of people involved in making these projects happen, but on the ground, the Department of Utilities work are the ones actually moving the gravel. Awesome, thanks Erica. Teamwork mm -hmm. makes the dream work. Um, so a few, few more great questions here. We got about 10, 10 minutes more. Um, uh, so a participant asked about um, who did the art for the Ansel campaign. Um, yeah, thanks, it is beautiful. Um, it's Stephanie Taylor is the artist um, and a lot of this artwork was completed uh, as part of the Water Forum 20th anniversary. Um, and it's part of a mural that is on the uh, County Administration Building in Midtown. So check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, um, and then a couple of participants had questions about flow management um, and, and temperature management. Um, so a participant asked, um, when completed, will flows be managed for optimal spawning? Um, so Water Forum also um, works on flow management um, you know, with the Bureau of Reclamation. Ian, do you wanna talk about flow management? Ian or John, anything you wanna add there? We manage flows for a bevy of different reasons. Um, and right now we manage them for a drought. So flow scheduling and flow, um, the usage of the water looks a little different right now. Uh, we do try to have flows and temperatures optimal for fish throughout the year when the water allows it. Um, something we're, we're dealing with right now is we don't have the cold water storage behind Folsom that we normally do on a average water year. So this summer, the temperatures in the American are gonna be a little warmer than they should be um, due to that. So right now we're in kind of a, a different situation, but when we are operating with the normal water year, we do keep the fish interest in mind. Um, particularly, we like to keep an eye on the oversummering steelhead and uh, make sure fall, uh, flows are adequate for spawning in reds and that flows don't drop too quickly to uh, which can lead to drying out of reds. So the nests getting dried out. Um, I hope this is answering the question. So to summarize, we do keep uh, fish interests in mind when operating flows. Thanks, Ken. And you, you talked about temperature management a little bit. A, a participant um, asked, you know, how does water temperature come into play and how is it maintained when needed? Um, and as I understand temperatures probably the biggest limiting factor on the Lower American River. Um, and this year is probably going to be, it is a really hard year for temperature management. Um, and Alan says he's praying for rain and snow. Thanks, me too. Um, it's a little late now, but next year. Um, and then anything else I'm missing? Anything anyone want to add? There's a question about um, who provides water forum funding? Um, 
it's your your local water purveyors, Sacramento County. Um, water Forms a really cool coalition of, of water purveyors, environmental groups, citizen organizations, um, and most of our funding comes from Sacramento County um, and water purveyors. Um, and then a question about um, the boundary, the boundary, the project boundary. Um, they they thought they saw that the bike trail on the south side of the river might be affected. Are we going to stop stop bike or trail traffic there? Um, I don't I don't think so. No, um, I think Erica, am I am I am I wrong? Is that the boundary doesn't uh, cross the bike trail? Some of our materials. Yeah, so in oh. that boundary cross the bike trail, but it is not a um, it is not a, a closure. So um, please refer to the the updated map on our Ansel Hoffman project webpage and the one um, we can pop back up to that slide if we need to. The one in this presentation has been updated with that project boundary removed because that boundary was is not relevant to to site management or closures. So the bike trail will remain open. And that higher spot is a uh, is a great place to see the river, and um, there will be no closures other than the exact construction area where we're conducting excavation or material placement during um, during equipment operation. Awesome, thanks, Erica. And then uh, a question, also uh, the Rossmore boat ramp, will it be open? Yes, it should be open during construction. Um, that is an area where we will have a signage posted, letting folks know, because that's our closest upstream put in, where we want to let folks know that they might be held for a few minutes to make sure that we don't have equipment in the river when they're passing down. But uh, it will remain open during, during the work. Great. Thanks, Erica. I think that's all the questions that I see. Can I, hey, Kat, can I add yeah. on? to John's answer from a few questions ago about reds and the red count. Go for it. Um, so something about reds in the lower American river, they are not always the easiest to count because there's a phenomenon that occurs in the lower American river called superimposition of reds. And that is a product of supply and demand um, or density dependence as we call it in biology. But uh, what that is is we have more fish coming in the river than we do spawning area. And it's not a first come first serve for that spawning area. A, a pair of salmon will make a red and then move away from it. And within you know a short time, a new pair of fish will come and make a red on top of that old red. So it, you don't get two good reds out of this. You get no good reds out of superimposition. So, Counting red, I read one study where the total amount of reds had 42% of imposition, superimposition on it in one year in the Lower American River, which is ridiculously high. So by creating this additional spawning habitat, it'll allow that supply of spawning habitat to reach the demand a bit better with the fish. And hopefully we'll see less superimposition of reds. Um, those superimpositions make it very difficult to count reds as well. So the more healthy single reds we have um, depends on the amount of area we, we have gravel. So this is a big key to that project. Yeah, thank you so much for adding that because understanding that makes it, yeah, really, really clear why these kind of projects are needed. Thanks, Ian. Um, thanks everyone for awesome questions. Um, and don't be shy, reach out if you got more. Um, I think we're right at seven, so we can we can wrap up um, and say good night to you all. Thanks for spending your evening with us.